everybody. My name is Matt Chumway. I'm currently an animator and supervisor at Industrial Light and Magic. I'm here to talk to you today about our creature animation and, and animal animation. I was one of the animation supervisors on Life of Pi. Um, so I'm going to take you through a demo. Um, first I'm going to take you through a walk cycle and uh, then we'll apply that walk cycle to a path um, and then we'll time warp that to match a scene that we're going to animate. Um, and then I, I hope you enjoy the demo and thanks to Anim Squad for letting me come down and uh, show you all this. Enjoy! This is walking in, walks up her steps, turns down, thinks for a second, and then lies down. Okay, so I would consider this kind of a, a blocking level. This, this would be something I would show uh, the director and get feedback from and say, well, what do you think of the tummy? What do you think of what's going on here? And this is kind of a good um, way to present your work. What we're gonna do, uh, I'm gonna attach um, the tiger to a locator and then locator to the motion path. You can attach straight to it, but I do find sometimes problems with input connections to the rig kind of do some wonky things. So if you just kind of parent it to a locator, you can just delete that locator when you're done and it kind of erases all your uh, stuff. So take a look at little subtle knee wobbles and things like that. Uh, we get very mathematical with our, our walk as we did in the beginning. Um, when it lands, you have a little wobble to the knee and a little wobble to the elbows. You can see when he steps, boom, right there. That's a nice little foot landing there. Now what's happening, you know, he stands there and there's a little wobble to the bone underneath, but then his skin is going all all, all around. So, uh, now we're going to add a uh, time warp to this to uh, kind of adjust the, I mean, everything everything is looking pretty good, except it's just kind of this very even walk, which isn't natural. And if you look at the reference over there, um, it has a nice little pause when it uh, goes up on the uh, step there. So uh, we'll try to incorporate a little bit of that into it. What's going on right now is that we're still treadmilling. This is not in world space, and we need to get it in world space. Sorry, I skipped that step. So um, this is what we're going to do. We're going to kind of do the same thing we did to get it on treadmill. We're going to do the same thing to get it off the treadmill. And don't feel like you have to. Um, over crank things for us to see them. Uh, keep them subtle, keep them correct. Um, I don't want to see Toast just freak out and start shaking all over the place just so you show everyone that that's what you're doing because that won't look right and it'll look like you're not really paying attention to what's going on. Uh, it's about layering in um, just subtle motions, some that you can barely recognize, it, but it does make a difference. It moves those pixels enough to make it feel real. So be aware of that. Okay, so now everything's in world space. We are done baking this guy, I think, for the rest of the demo here. Just get it, because it's kind of a pain. Okay, so now we can go back in and start cleaning up these feet. So let's start with the front left foot. So this is a case where layering and secondary controls are pretty useful. Just be aware that it's a little hard to read the animation in there, so remembering Remember how you're driving everything. If you don't have very good memory, you might even jot it down and say, this is what my approach was. Because, you know, two weeks later, three weeks later, when you go back in, you're not going to remember what you did. But in that case, sometimes I'll bake the control down to one uh, control, and then it puts it all back together again for you. How, what's the best way to kind of approach kind of the way it, it's moving? Let's, overall, big motions first, and look at... In this case, the hips and shoulders are very separated, but they do work together. So keep an eye on that. When that when those hips pull down, it kind of feels like the shoulders don't go anywhere. They do, um, and you can probably get away with a little forward and back motion. You're, you're not really seeing it on the tiger, but it is connected. Um, they have small little eye shifts and stuff like that. They're a lot more subtle, and they kind of move with the head. It kind of makes them more frightening and kind of scary that they're so focused. Um, but when we were working on, on Pi, we were trying different things, and we found when we kept the eyes a little bit more locked, you know, with just some subtle movements, it just felt more like a tiger and less like we're trying to give a tiger a human personality. You know, he's still very obviously on his path here, 
so this this area, you know, could be a good day of work right here, just making sure that he's properly going over. And you get this kind of cool cat stuff too. Right now he's just default walk, going almost like he's going up a hill. Um, but getting that weight, getting the head to drop, getting that next stretch all the way through the foot, really cool stuff. Um, we do do that a lot um, on projects, specifically on Life of Pi. We did that a lot in the beginning. We, we would take a clip like this and literally trace it, um, which it was less about the animation exercise and more about us going through the process of recreating what we saw on the screen. And it was great because unless it looked like what we had there, we weren't done yet. So it really showed us where the muscles were moving and how the fur was reacting to the way the legs were moving. And we had this one-to-one -one reference and it was really great because we got it to a point that looked really amazing uh, from this reference that was shot in uh, France early on. It was the same tiger that was used in the movie, but they were, they're, they're French tigers. Um, and uh, the and the director, uh, Eric DeBoer, he showed it to, uh, and Bill Weston, Hopkins, the VFX, who showed it to uh, Ang Lee. He said, uh, what do you think of this reference? And uh, Ang looked at it and he goes, oh, yeah, yeah that's great. Um, yeah, let's let's see the tiger on it. And then Bill, he loves to do this. He goes, yep, that's, that is our tiger that you're looking at. So he loves to trick the director. But you can't, he waits till he gets it to that perfect place to show it to him. And it's, it's a great way to build a rapport with the director and, uh, because... One of the cool things about studying live action reference and animals and that kind of stuff is they do really weird things. Things that if you just animate it straight out and showed it to an animation director, you get it rejected so quickly because it just looks weird. But what's cool is if you can back it up with reference and say, look, this is what it can do, it actually adds this kind of extra layer of realism to it. All right. So I brought it up really high. Um, that is not correct. Uh, like I said, cats are pretty efficient animals, and they'll only put in as much energy as they need to accomplish a task. Um, dogs, on the other hand, much more floppy, much less efficient. Um, it's hilarious watching dogs. Sometimes their back legs will get ahead of their front legs. And um, they did some wonderful stuff in 101 Dalmatians. Um, if you watch that, where they've got that run where the back feet are getting ahead. Cats don't tend to do that. Cats are very, very streamlined. Uh, tail is an afterthought, so we'll worry about that later. Um, tails, though, however, for a cat, almost have a mind of its own. Uh, we won't necessarily do that for this cycle. I want to give a proper kind of motion cycle to it. But it's really cool, and really the best way to give a performance to your tail is look at reference, see what they do, because they they react in all sorts of different ways. Cats are, you know, they speak through their tail a lot. So there we go. Now we're getting our attitude that we want in there. Um, but definitely one thing you notice is how disconnected the head is. So uh, I'm going to change that offset just a little bit um, so it's not so disconnected. I do want to take you through, uh, well, let's do the tail real quick. And then I do want to take you through uh, at least one of the feet uh, with the toes so you can see the kind of detail that's to be expected. For a lot of shows like Life of Pi, I was telling you that we, would, we always tend to start with reference and we'll match it one to one. Um, this is not what I'm necessarily going to do here. This will be more like what we would do if we got a shot from um, a movie and this is what needs to happen in the scene. We would then scour uh, YouTube or whatever video service of your choice and uh, we try to find reference that fits. Sometimes you'll find one piece of reference that's awesome. Um, most of the time that's not the case. Uh, you'll look through and find like, oh, I like that head turn or I like that walk. I like, you know, this turn right here. And you, you'll you have all your reference available to you. So it's about uh, looking at that reference for timing and for uh, ideas, but it's not necessarily for copying one-to-one. -one. Um, we're going to put them on a path. And the way the Maya path works is um, it doesn't lock the feet to the ground, unfortunately. We'll, so we'll, we'll clean that up later. Um, but it's kind of a, a time-based thing. It's going to, whatever you set, you know, 1 to 300, at frame 1 is going to start at the front of the curve, 300 is going to go to the end of the curve. So. Uh, what I'd like to do first, before we do that, let's, we need to kind of design our curve. 